True. Anytime. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Justin Stubleski from the camera shop in Muskegon, and I'm here with Jamie McDonald, Michigan photographer extraordinaire. And uh, we're here uh, to do your your Sunday 2 p.m. live Q&A with Jamie and I. So welcome, welcome. Kind of wait for people to tick in here. How are you doing this uh, this wonderful afternoon, Jamie? Uh, not bad. It's gorgeous outside. I was kind of wandering around my yard. Oh, I don't have it with me. It's in my coat pocket. I was wandering around with the Olympus Tough TG6 point and shoot. Okay. Uh, you know, the macro mode on those is oh yeah, just crazy. So that's kind of what I was doing out in my yard was just wandering around and, you know, just taking pictures of flowers and trying to find bugs. You know, it's still a little early in the season for bugs, but I was looking. Hey, Liz from Louisiana. How are you doing? I called you Liz. I have no idea if that's appropriate or not, but Elizabeth from louisiana hello how are you doing yeah i have a, i have a tendency to shorten people's names too right I, I don't know if i'm stepping on toes when i do that uh or not but sorry if i did um hey how's it going mike good to have you on today i hope everybody Thanks. out there is is doing well on this sunday this easter sunday for those who are doing easter yeah that's that's right it's it's also easter sunday so happy easter to everyone who's who's joining us yeah it's a, it's a good uh, good break from those who had like a big Easter lunch or something, I guess. They can sit back and watch <laughs> us on their computer or their phone or their, their smart TV. <laughs> or, or they're jumping from their live Easter broadcast to a live oh, Q&A broadcast. Yeah. Right. So if you're, if you're filled with church and you're filled with Easter ham and deviled eggs, you know, welcome. <laughs> right. So Justin <laughs> and I were talking um, before the show just of the – the format of this and things to talk about. I know, you know, we kind of put you guys on the spot a little bit and we're saying, you know, bring your questions, you know, ask questions. And if you don't have questions, that's, that's totally that's fine. Okay. Um, I know Justin and I had talked before the show, a couple of topics that we could discuss. Um, one of them was this, which has been, there we go. Let me get my focal plane. This has been a little controversial for some people for some reason That's the 12 to 45 from Olympus. And so I know we'll probably spend some time talking about that. I know we talked about uh, maybe a little bit of my back history. I know some of you have, uh, well, I, probably everybody that's in the chat right now currently knows my story. But for those who catch this after the fact, um, who might not know who I am or what I do, uh, we can probably delve into a little bit of my history in photography. And uh, of course, as I always like to do for anything video, I like to bring still photos along so we can maybe talk about some photos, things that I've been shooting lately during the whole uh, lockdown, shelter in place, quarantine, pandemic, you know, sweeping the globe. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still sneaking out. We'll just say that. <clears throat> yeah. But is it really sneaking? I mean, that's, let's, let's oh, be honest. It's no, it, it's, it's not like you're putting on the camouflage paint and going out at, at uh, night or something right exactly I mean, I'm <laughs> flying down country roads in my big white truck with camera hanging out the window hardly hardly uh undercover <laughs> in what i'm doing yeah. So. yeah it's not like we have to go to the extent of uh, arnold schwarzenegger from predator you know getting yeah, down in the mud, in mud. And <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're invisible to infrared <laughs> now to take photos <laughs> for sure uh, but yeah so um i'm thinking i'm just gonna i'm i'm gonna take the the lead here and just say, let's talk yeah. about this lens. Yeah. Uh, so it. it's, it's kind of just hitting the streets. Hey, Brad, how are you doing? So we got a uh, lo local Muskegon guy here, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so this is the 12 to 45 from Olympus. Uh, it's funny because I posted when I got this, I just did a quick little Facebook post and maybe across Twitter and things like that of this lens talking about, Hey, I got it. I'm glad I got this. And immediately, was hit with questions well why don't you just use the 12 to 40 it's the pro lens it's a faster aperture uh why would you get that when you already have the 12 to 40 a lot of questions regarding why this when you already have the 12 to 40 which is arguably the better of the two um faster aperture faster constant aperture uh, has the focus clutch on it which this one does not have the manual focus clutch on it and the inability to keep my rear lens cap on apparently. Um, <laughs> so people asked again repeatedly why. Unfortunately, my 12 to 40 is not handier. I should have had it 
ready for this, but to do a side by side, but this is darn near half the size of the 12 to 40. I mean, it's noticeably smaller diameter, um, shorter as well and much lighter. So that again, kind of, you, you happen to have the 12 to 40 handy. Uh, no, this is 12 oh, to 45 okay. still. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know if you were going to be able to do a magic trick and pull out the side <laughs> by side like I should be doing right now. But uh, the impetus behind me getting this lens was a trip that I'm still certain I'm going to be doing the first week of June to Iceland with my sons. Uh, we were supposed to go there for 10 days and travel by camper van around the whole country on the ring road. And uh, three young guys... Yes, I'm one of the young guys uh, traveling around the country in a camper van that's made to hold three people and probably minimal gear uh, size and space requirements and, you know, considerations are important. So that's why I got this. This is still a weather sealed lens, which is going to be important in Iceland. Uh, and again, just for the, the packing and portability reasons alone, that was the main driver for me getting the 12 to 45 uh, as with. In my opinion, almost every single Olympus lens, the image quality is there. You know, this lens is designed to work, you know, specifically for their cameras. The whole design philosophy behind where Olympus is at with mirrorless from the conception was they call it a telecentric design. You know, this the optics in this lens were designed to feed straight through the lens right onto the image sensor, whereas um, original DSLR designs were taking into account pinaprisms and mirror boxes and all that. It wasn't necessarily a straight shot to the, to the film plane. I don't think if, I don't know if you're familiar with film cameras or not just into that degree, but I was always under the impression that the, um, the image was kind of bounced around a little bit in camera before it hit the film plane. I thought it like, I thought the, well, outside of it bouncing around, I also thought it like it, it, it like the light curves onto the, the, the film the, plane the film plane yeah right. where because that's why they to kind of tangential with this like sony had a um had a uh what do you call those things where uh it, when your stuff is in production i can't think of the word like a prototype prototype pre-production not, not a prototype it's like when things are on paper still not a oh it's um, just, just the design phase you mean like a yeah when they take concept? out a what's that concept no, 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 it's a, it's a concept. It's like when they patent it. That's you. Get, that's what I'm looking okay, for. They're looking. Yeah. Sorry, it takes me forever to <laughs> dig for words in my brain. Um, but they had a patent for um for like a design a curve sensor, kind of like a like a curved television, and uh, that's kind of the idea where like if light is cur is if light's curving coming out of the lens and hitting the like hitting a flat sensor plane, just make it curve so you get the sharpness. Gotcha. Right, the opposite edge. edge. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the edge to edge, and so that was kind of the idea where you know, with what you're talking about, it's telecentric, you know, telecentric. So it's just hitting. It's hitting flat on the the plane, mm -hmm. you know, as, yep. as it was designed to be that way. So, um, again, I just kind of kind of got a little bit off on a tangent, but for those curious about this, uh, my initial impressions and experiences with this are just like with any of the other lenses. The the optical um, characteristics of this are they're great. It's sharp edge to edge, just like you would expect. I'm not one of those people that will get out a piece of graph paper or, and check for pin cushion and barrel distortion and things like that. It really, I don't, I don't pixel peep at that, that level. So um, no matter what, if I'm shooting something like architecture or anything of that nature, I'm going to go in and perspective correct anyways, because I don't have, you know, a way to tilt shift this to correct for it. So any sort of, you know, barreling or anything like that, or sort of issues, issues with, um, Corners you know, and corners, straight lines. Exactly. I, I don't focus on those like someone who's crazy serious about it would. So um, again, initial impressions. I'm glad I made the investment in this. I actually, I didn't want to wait <laughs> for Olympus to send me this lens. I just pre-ordered it and bought it just so that I know that I would know that I would have it in time for this impending, hopefully, trip that I was going to be taking. Uh, and the close focus ability of this lens is, is pretty phenomenal too. That's something I've found a lot with a lot of Olympus lenses. Uh, especially some of the more fun ones like the eight millimeter fisheye and the seven to 14, you can just about have the front element touching your subject and get focus, which makes for some really interesting and fun ways to shoot small objects, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Cause they're so tight up against, so tight up against the camera in the frame. And, um, 
because of the distortion that you would get being so close, it just makes things just look, it's super fun to do. But, you know, again, back to the 12 to 40, uh, I'm loving it so far. Again, weather sealed, important to me. And uh, the size, oh my gosh, it's so small. I'm kind of getting back into that frame of mind, you know, that drew that drew me and so many people into Olympus initially was the, the portability factor. Once you throw this on something like the EM5 Mark III, or if you have an EM5 Mark II or something like that, or a non-gripped body, I mean, it's perfect combination. Well, and, and, and to that point, like some of the things that Mike and I uh, talked about on Wednesday uh, when we did our live broadcast uh, and we were talking about this, uh, the fact that this lens. Um, so here, you know, Mike, speaking of Mike, Mike jumped in and had the exact answer that I was. So Mike is a tech rep for Olympus. So he knows all the crazy technical information. So no one better to answer what I was trying to get across than Mike who has it spelled out perfectly here. So again, it just kind of lets you know that, the lens designs for DSLRs are just, they have to take into account so many different things. Olympus's telecentric design just makes it straightforward, straight back to the image sensor with full coverage uh, without any, you know, issues in the corners and things like that. Thanks Mike for jumping in and, and throwing that out there like that. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm glad Mike's Mike's viewing, you know, he can, he can keep us in check while he's, uh, <laughs> right. uh, while he's in Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I slip up and say something completely wrong, jump in, Mike, I'd be, I'd be glad to uh, have that happen. Well, and, and speaking of it being on a, on an EM five Mark three. Perfect. That's a very small capable kit right there. Weather sealed again, no, which for someone, for someone like me, that's important. Uh, I'll share a couple of photos here in a little bit when I start going through doing some photo sharing and you'll understand why weather sealing is important to me. Uh, it, right. And I, and I think like the other thing that we talked about was the fact that when you have your 12 to 42, eight at, mm -hmm. uh, at a thousand bucks, you know, nine ninety nine ninety nine, 99. Mm -hmm. uh, and even when it's on sale for eight forty nine ninety nine, that's the lowest I've seen it as of yet is your, you've got a lens that's still six forty nine. you know, even though it's an F four, it is smaller. It's more compact. It's closer to that 24 to 105 um, focal length. And if you're not doing portraiture or you're not doing like this low light stuff and you just want like kind of like this all around street lens, you know, you don't have to switch between multiple lenses and you're going to have the ability to do some macro along the way. So if you're, if you're doing like a marketplace somewhere, perfect. Um, you know, uh, you know, Brian Essler, uh, who chimed in and said, hello, he did a review on it in Grand Rapids and he was able to go to one of the farmer's markets and kind of check out some of the street vendors and the bokeh is nice. You know, the up close macro is nice. And so for something that's, you know, $300 less than right. the 12 to 42 weights, um, you know, you might not have a lot of people going out to buy that lens. Um, but where I really see its strength is exactly what I have right here in my hands is, is in a kit, you know, a 12 to 45 EM five Mark three. So when someone's getting started with Olympus, someone who might not have purchased a camera before, um, it's a great combo to get started with. It's the you know, perfect to, gateway drug. <laughs> yeah. Because, because once you have that lens, like, yeah, sure. You can, you could migrate to the 12 to 42, eight, but really your next lens is, you know, if you're only shooting landscapes and you're going to be at F8 anyways, you know, and you're not shooting portraits, there's really no need to go buy, you know, a 12 to 40. And then really the next lens would be a seven to 14 or mm -hmm. 40 to 150. Right. So, and you save some money doing it. Right. So, um, Liz says she's got a question from Mike or potentially us if we can answer it. So sure. uh, she can go ahead and pop that in the, the chat there and we'll get that queued up. We'll ask it out loud for you <laughs> and see what Mike has to say. <clears throat> I'm just going to sit here and wait just a second and see if she jumps in with her question. Now we're putting her on the spot and making her type really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Move those fingers. Well, right. I mean, and the other thing is too, I mean, I'm in the business uh, for those of you who don't know, um, you know, I work at the camera shop in Muskegon. So here on the West side of the state of Michigan. So I see people, you know, day in and day out who are looking to get it into a camera system and what's going to be the best one for them. So what I try to do is, you know, I try to take in all the variables, like, what are you going to shoot? How are you going to shoot with it? Um, are you going to be traveling? You know, all these things. And, 
and really kind of writing the the right prescription for what's the perfect camera for you. Right. So, yep. Are you guys seeing a a big influx of Olympus users in like the last year and a half, two years at your store? A lot of uh, system switchers, DSLR in particular. Um, you know, there's there has been a migration to mirrorless. There, there, and the funny thing is, um. So to kind of give you a, a cross section of what our customer base is like, um, you know, back in 2012, I had not, I did not swallow the pill for for mirrorless. I wasn't even on board with Olympus. It wasn't until about 2015 when the EM5 Mark II came out that it's like, okay, there's something to the system. And since that day, our Olympus sales have increased every year from sure. that point. And uh, you know, just recently within the last six months. I had my first couple of customers come in and, you know, t you know, people will come in and say, oh, I'm looking for mirrorless. But now it's like people are coming in saying I'm looking for an Olympus mirrorless camera. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's something where we've always been strong in the in like we're, we have a strong Olympus base here in West Michigan. Um, I mean, that's why we're like one of their like flagship stores for the test and wow program because right. of how many how many customers we have here in the, in the side of the state. So I hope that answers the question. If I missed anything, yeah, let me know. No, for sure. Definitely. As Brad said, he's uh, going to consider saving money for an Olympus camera. I'd say very good to consider that Brad. Very good. <laughs> and Elizabeth says she also uses uh, EM five Mark EM five Mark two, maybe um, or EM one Mark. II. <clears throat> okay. So Elizabeth's question was, She's using a MacBook Pro and Olympus Capture. She said recently it will not recognize her camera. She got the tethers, hookup is good, yet nothing. She's lost with it with frustration. Hmm. And I, last person to ask about that because uh, Olympus Capture definitely is more of a studio kind of shooting setup. Uh, I suppose you could use it for landscape, but uh, I don't lug a laptop into the into the back country with me. So I'm the last person to ask maybe if Mike's still watching, he's got some tips on getting the, the camera to be recognized in Olympus capture. Um, my first recommendation though, would be to start asking you more questions back to get more information. Like if you've recently had a software update to your Mac, because um, mm -hmm. potentially sometimes software updates tend to break things until the other side of the software, which would be Olympus um, does an update to, catch up, I guess, to where Apple's at with theirs. Uh, and Elizabeth says she uses it uh, for studio recording. So yeah, any, if you have any more information, uh, anything that's been updated, firmware updates to camera or lenses, um, if you're on the most recent version of the Olympus Capture software, that helps to know that. And also uh, where your Mac OS software is at. And Elizabeth is saying that, yes, she did a recent update. So and Brian Essler is jumping in, but we've got a lot of people that are going to help with this one. Um, whoop, there we go. There's Brian. Just make sure that your capture is up to date. Uh, <clears throat> he said that uh, Mac OS Catalina was a bit of an uh, issue at first, as it was with a lot of software when it first came out. I didn't upgrade to Catalina for a minute because it basically made your Mac not recognize a Drobo if you have one, and that's where I store all my stuff is on a Drobo. So. <clears throat> Yeah, and good to, it's a good to point that out as well, Brian, that Catalina wasn't just an issue for Olympus users. So it's not like there's anything, no strikes against Olympus here. It was just, I think that there are enough massive changes under the hood with Catalina to where it affected a lot of people's software. So other manufacturers saw that as well. Yeah, is that, is that something that's indicative of like Apple products? It just seems like I see a lot more convert, like, compatibility issues with updates and such with software after they do an update? Um, not usually. I know that this was like a major overhaul to the operating system. So I think that that's probably what it was. But historically, I have never really run into any issues. And one of the things that I think would be a pro on the Apple side, for some reason, they tend to keep up with camera manufacturers on recognizing raw files. So mm -hmm. Um, I know a lot of like my colleagues at work or whatever on their Windows PCs, if I sent them a raw file, the thumbnail would just be a file thumbnail, but I can actually see the image in the thumbnail, um, you know, yeah, for before, the raw files, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, but this one, again, I think this, this OS update for Mac was definitely a, a headache 
for a lot of pieces of software. So, but typically no. Um, Elizabeth is asking, um, are there any suggestions for maybe another software program that she could use? And what exactly are you using the software for? Because I see that you said that for you're using it for studio recording. So are you doing something like we're doing here where you're recording video that's being fed from your EM1 Mark II? Or are you using it as a display to show people the images that you're capturing, kind of like you would see in a portrait studio? Um, knowing that would help because I think if you're going to be doing it for recording video, there are definitely other options out there other than than that. Again, not having that, no familiarity with with the Olympus software for that, I really couldn't say. Pro makeup artist, okay. Yeah, so she's trying to do some videos some to videos. maintain. Yeah, yep. I would honestly say to do what we're doing, wouldn't you, Justin? Use something uh, like StreamYard? Oh, yeah. I, I, Elizabeth, let me tell you firsthand that, um, you know, J Jamie approached, uh, approached me a couple weeks ago about doing, you know, live video. And we were always, we wanted to do this since last year but we were looking at OBS, which is open broadcast software. And that's mm -hmm. a really great program, but it's so convoluted. It's like you you need to really use it to understand it. And there's, there's a lot of complexity to it. So uh, really all I needed was a capture card, which mm -hmm. we've got the Elgato SD60S. There's other ones out there, but that's the most you need. And StreamYard is just like this really easy program where basically get the camera, you plug it in uh, to the capture card, make sure you have like, th the nice thing is, um, you know, you can have all this nice studio set up, but really like Mike Amico, um, when he is, when, when we did our broadcast uh, on Wednesday, he didn't have his, uh, his lighting or his microphone set up yet because uh, he needed permission to install the software on his laptop. So we were kind of at a disadvantage. So he just piped in through his phone mm -hmm. and, and you know, his quality was, his visual quality was better than mine. So it's, it just makes it really easy and uh, it, it's really nice to connect. And then you can just record your videos from what I understand, Jamie, instead of going live, you can just mm -hmm. record it like you're in your own little studio. Right. Um, and does that save it to your hard drive and then you can edit it through like Adobe Premiere or something like that? That's exactly right. So once okay. you're, once you've done with your, once you're done with your broadcast or in your, in your case, you would just jump into the studio like we're at here and just kind of set it up as a test and just have it record. And then when it's done, you can download that whole video file and then throw it into Final Cut or iMovie or whatever it is you're using on your Mac mm -hmm. to edit video and then adjust it from there. Uh, I think also you could probably look at doing something like, uh, I can probably get you a link for the device that I'm using, they're kind of hard to come by right now because I think everybody's streaming right now, mm -hmm. but it's just this little USB device, again, made by Elgato. It's called the Cam Link. And what it is, is it's just a USB plug. It looks like a USB flash drive, like, you know, like one of these little deals. And one end is USB and it plugs into your MacBook. And then the other end of it has an HDMI hookup. And what you do is you hook the HDMI end into the back of that USB deal and then the other end into your uh, EM1 Mark II. And when it's plugged into your computer, your computer just sees it as another camera, at which point you could start using something like QuickTime even to record the feed from your camera. Uh, pretty simple to set up. That's what I would do. It's probably the easiest. You wouldn't even need to use a service. Yeah, so it's going to be something very similar to what Justin's got right there. And that's the USB end that would plug in to your computer, of course. And mm -hmm. then you would have the HDMI out right there that would plug in. I wish it's looking for my face and not this, but you can see the HDMI and that would yep. plug into your And which one is camera. that? Which one are you using um, right there? That was, that was one that we started with earlier. That's StarTech.com. Um, okay. This will stream from what I – because I went back on our Amazon – uh, purchase history. And from what I could see, I think it was 1080p at 50 frames per second, not 60. Mm. Um, so that's kind of the thing is like first, I, th I think when I talked to Ian, when he, he said it would be good for like doing 720p broadcasts. Okay. Um, so if you wanted some, just higher quality, you know, but that was like 27 bucks. So you oh, don't have wow. to spend you don't have to spend a lot of money yeah, to get good. what you need. Um, 
you know, I, again, I'm using the Elgato SD60S, which is the um, kind of the next step up, you know, from what you recommended. Sure. Um, yeah. And also what you're using is, is a capture card that's inserted into the computer or is it USB? This one's USB. So it's very okay, much good. like, yep. Um, actually, I can probably, um, I'll just kind of show you right here. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. So um, maybe if we get a minute, I can pop a link in here into the chat. So I know that uh, depending on what year your MacBook Pro is to, you might also have uh, USB-C as a connection. So we'd have to do a little bit of research for you to figure out if if that's going to be a potential issue or not. I know that my I do a podcast, Mirrorless Minutes, and my co-host on that show, he was using the same thing I'm using, the Cam Link, and then moved to a MacBook Pro that just has USB-C. And uh, he ran into all kinds of issues trying to use an adapter to go from USB 3 to USB C, and it just never really worked out for him. So, what was the model that you were using, Justin? It's the can it's Elgato. What again? I'm sorry, I'm going to look this up for Elizabeth so we can get her all set up today. It's the HD 60s is what I've got, and I've got the box, another box. So, hang on, I can grab that. Cool. So this, you know, like Justin said, this is a little bit more pricier than the the cheaper one that he mentioned, but you know, the quality again is going to be probably what you're looking at. I'm seeing it on Amazon. It's about $180 to $185. But, you know, again, you know, it's going to be one of those things where, where you'll want to, uh, you invest now and, and you'll be happy that you did. Uh, I would swing over to that link on Amazon, check it out and maybe read some of the reviews and see what people say about compatibility with USB-C or maybe look and see if they have a version of that that is USB-C as well. Yeah. And I, and I got that. There is, there is one more that's better than that. I mean, there's a couple more that are better than that. Sure. Um, but uh, the next one up would do 4k and you know, for what most people are doing, um, you know, unless you're broadcasting on a television or something like right. in house. Well, okay. So, so Elizabeth, the, she's a makeup artist. Uh, the devil is in the details when it comes to those things. So she's probably going to want the best resolution she can get. Uh, and if you're recording this and not live streaming it, then definitely go for the 4K route. Uh, mm -hmm. Do the 4K capture, upload it to YouTube. People can watch it in 4K on YouTube, you know, obviously provided their monitors or televisions or whatever are 4K. But I would think for what you do, um, maybe look at investing in the 4K version. Now, now my question, just to be... Devil's devil advocate? Dead. Yes. I love that. Yeah, go for it. Uh, is... From what I've been told, like even if we watch football on television, mm -hmm. you can have a 4K television, but there's not enough data. There's not enough room in broadcast television to stream 4K to a television. So it's like 1080p plus. It's not quite 4K. So if you're streaming online, is that the same case? It's kind of like, is it still 1080p plus or is it truly 4K? Well, so I've got a... Well, you can't see it back there behind me, but above that little fireplace thing there, I've got a 75 inch 4k TV and I can see a difference when I stream 1080p from YouTube to 4k from YouTube. Um, noticeable big okay. difference. So potentially, I mean, again, it's going to, there are so many factors that are involved with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you run into a bandwidth issue at home, they're obviously going to th throttle that down and down res you to, to 1080p to 720p or whatever is appropriate to keep the stream rolling for you. So, and right now, who knows what's going on with bandwidth. I've been pretty lucky with bandwidth so far where I'm at, but I know everyone in the United States is streaming content nonstop now. So, yeah, you know, that tends to be a potential issue. But again, for Elizabeth, um, you could always capture in 4K and upload in 4K and then YouTube will, will uh, you know, change the, the bit rate or the, the resolution depending on your viewers connection anyways. And I'm assuming that you're going to do this on YouTube. I don't know. That would help to know, I guess a little bit too. Well, and, and that would be the case if she's live streaming, if she's just uploading it after the fact, then mm -hmm. it's really, it's on the receiver's end on what their internet connection is like. Correct. I will yeah. say, um, unless you're on like a fiber connection, uploading, uploading, I don't know how long your videos are, but I'm going to guess <laughs> it probably takes a good half hour to do a makeup job or more, maybe a half hour of 4k. You're going to hit upload 
I would suggest doing it at like 10 o'clock at night and then getting up the next morning and knowing that it's done because it'll take a yeah. minute. <laughs> yeah, tr try to try to avoid the peak times of the day. I mean, that's kind of the biggest thing. It's like, um, and be mindful. Like, you know, we say that, Jamie, like 10, 10 p.m. But what's, Califor <laughs> what's California doing at... 10 p.m. our time you know that could be their time when they're streaming everything so right well okay so devil's advocate little so um you know that it's not just this one pipe for the whole country so i mean youtube is serving their their videos from servers all around the globe so it's probably gonna be more of a regional thing when you run into bandwidth constrictions and and issues so i think she'll be okay she's in louisiana so i think she's eastern or central time so she uh, she should be central East Eastern, I think it's I Eastern. Know. She's because it, it's east of the Mississippi, isn't it? Yes. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> say Eastern. <laughs> um, now Elizabeth. Oh God. Uh, well, Chicago's the odd man out. Like, uh, right? She's Central. Ah. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? You learn something new every single day. Um. Now, now, see, uh, Elizabeth, this is the cool thing about StreamYard. Um, Jamie encouraged me to buy their um, their basic package, which is like two fifty a year, mm -hmm. roughly, and you can stream to two locations at once. So even though you like to do Facebook, like what we're doing right now, um, Jamie is actually streaming simultaneously to YouTube. So you can kind of pick the locations that you want to go to, and there's one more membership that goes to five. But like who's streaming to LinkedIn and some of these other things now, unless you're looking for a cushy job, maybe out in New York or something, right? you know, or Chicago, then those other platforms, you know, mm -hmm. are kind of, you know, non-essential. Um, but it's there, you know, it's like it, it all boils down to how much you want to spend to have fun right. doing this. Yeah. StreamYard has been great. I uh, jumped in on with their service when they were in beta and it was it was free to everyone during the beta. So it got a feel for what its capabilities were. And then when they rolled over into the paid model that we're on now, uh, I just here, take my money. <laughs> I'm not going to go away from it. It's so simple to set up a stream. And it took, you know, just a second to get this set up today. And like Justin said, you know, we're broadcasting live on, on their Facebook page, the camera shops, Facebook page. And then I'm also, kind of poaching viewers over to my YouTube channel as well. <laughs> uh, we're getting them anywhere and from anywhere we can. That's right. Uh, that's right. For sure. So, um, so Brad's got a question saying, assuming if you were to say for an Olympus, it would be good using different cameras for different types of photography, more megapixels for portraits and the other for landscape or sport, et cetera. Um, maybe not exactly in the way that you mentioned it, but yeah, I, I, for sure. Cameras are tools. They're tools. Um, I would say there's nothing wrong with having a couple of different systems and using them to what you feel and what you are seeing as their strong points. You know, I think, you know, honestly, for me, uh, a higher megapixel counts great for landscape photos, uh, just because you get more fine detail in the image than you would maybe necessarily on a, a crop sensor, uh, a little bit more dynamic range too, potentially. But again, um, also, my Olympus cameras, even though they are a half the sensor size of a full frame camera, those are kind of my go-to for landscape anyways, just because they're rugged and they're weather sealed and they're super portable and I can pack an entire kit out into the field with me. But yeah, if you can manage two systems at once, do it. There's why not? Well, and that's, that's the thing that I, I, you know, um, this is the story I want everyone to hear. And I, and I would tell it to the customers who are kind of really on the fence is that I, I had a gentleman come into the store and, and we might've had this conversation last week. Uh, you know, he, he has a Nikon, he's got a Sony and he's got an Olympus. And I said, Dave, why do you need all those cameras? And he goes, Justin, there's a reason I have three camera systems, you know, because everyone has this mentality. It's like, well, if I have a, if I have a Canon, I only want to spend my money on Canon lenses because that means I can't, like I'm wasting money on these other lenses and I won't be able to do everything I want to do with the system. Um, but Dave, he's got his Nikon, his Nikon is for event photography and he likes the way that it works with his flash shooting events. He has a Sony because, uh, and he has one of the first, first Sony a seven R's. 
Mm -hmm. So he's got a 36 megapixel mirrorless camera. And he's like, I use that because I want the megapixels from my landscapes. I want to be able to have that, that latitude if I need to crop in mm -hmm. or have more high dynamic, dynamic range. And he says, I have my Olympus because when I go for a walk, I don't want to carry the other two with me mm -hmm. because the lenses are big and the weight is there. And he's like, I just want something I can quickly throw in my pocket in my jacket pocket. And if I see something that I love, I can take it out and I can shoot with it. And, and from that day on, it was kind of like my, I had to sit there and think about it for a moment. And then he left and then it's like, it dawned on me. It's like, you can have more than one. You can have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, especially when Canon came out with, uh, not Canon, when Canon came out, um, especially when Sony came out with their A7 series and Sigma made and developed the MC11 adapter. And that was at the point where I had my 5D Mark III and I'm like, man, the Sony's like, there's really something to this Sony. Now I waited for generation two, um, but I purchased an A7R2 and I can use all my Canon glass on, on my A7R2 and I can still go back to Canon. So it's kind of like I, I was married, but I had my mistress on the side <laughs> and, and I got like, it didn't, it, it didn't matter. Like I, I still use my Canon for weddings, for event photography, because I knew how that interacted and worked, but I started using my Sony for all my landscape stuff. Yeah. So, so, so now, uh, so now I have Olympus in that whole mix now too. And I have two Olympus cameras. I have an EM one, two and an EM five, three. Yeah. And those are just, those are my fun cameras. Like I take those with me everywhere because it, I know, especially I, I, I think I left bridge open. So I don't know if I can share my screen. I don't think I can. Um, yeah, queue it up. I can pop it up for you if you want to. Um, so but I, but I, but I love the art modes, like the art modes with Olympus um, or even the double exposure. Like I can see that in camera and I can, I know what it's going to look like before it turns out. Yeah. So that's, that's what I love. It's a good point, Brad. Um, I know not, it doesn't make sense for everyone to even consider two, three, four camera systems or whatever, but you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of the approach that you were taking earlier. You said earlier that you're considering saving money for an Olympus camera. You're already invested in one system. If you're happy with, I think where you're at with that system, if you've got the lenses and the body and stuff that you want and need and are happy with, sure. Now is the time to start looking to maybe, you know, add a second system, a backup system or an alternate system. And just like you did with your first system, build it out piece by piece, you know, start off with a kit and upgrade a lens, you know, as time progresses, you know, you've still already got your main system as your working system. That's that you're happy with. But yeah, I, I say go for it, Brad, without a doubt. There we are. So we got, you're up in bridge. Yeah, I, I use that versus using Lightroom. And mm -hmm. I don't know how long it'll take to, to load going full screen here. But um, so I, I shoot in RAW and JPEG when I when I do the, the art filters, because I want to mm -hmm. be able, again, see what I'm shooting. But if I want to go back and change it, I can. Um, but I just love that, that that's what I saw on camera. You know, and that's what I got out of color. Yep. And, actu and actually, I'm going to be doing a little broadcast on WZZM 13, which is our ABC affiliate here in Muskegon on Monday, kind of talking about, um, you know, photo walks and stuff like that while everything's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's just kind of, it's just nice to be able to see what you're going to get in camera. And I just, I just love that. And I, Mike and I on Wednesday, we're going to talk about, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, multiple exposure in camera. So I'll be able to kind of show off some of that. Um, but, you know, it's just nice, like looking at one side of something like the, these, I forgot what they're called, but I didn't like what I was getting with the hot sky and some, like the back gray. Mm hmm so you just do a 180 shoot from the other side. Yeah. So. You know, it's, that's one of the things that I think is super fun about the Olympus cameras too, that I don't think it gets necessarily enough press or publicity or well, mention is the art filters because the art filters are, they're so fun. They, they, it changes everything up completely. I mean, you can go and put on like, I, I have a, a big affinity for the pop art filter but you can also customize the art filters on the camera too. So with the pop art, I like to add a vignette to it. And that's fun when you find those graffitied up alleyways and buildings and train cars and things like that to make the graffiti really pop up and, and start doing things like that. 
Well, and the thing I love is, you know, if we zoom in at a hundred percent, it's like the quality is still there, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's the thing is like a lot of people will pixel peep and it's like, well, if I print that, you know, yeah, I'm, right. that's exactly what it, it doesn't matter if I'm using my 42 megapixel Sony or, mm -hmm. or, or this, you know, it's, I don't know. Right. right. I mean, who is actually going to, if you print something out, who goes up and puts their face right to the print, which is what you're doing when you're zoomed in at, you know, 200% on your computer pixel peeping. So yeah, I think people get hung up too much on those kinds of things. And and what's nice, Brad, and anyone who's listening is that, uh, you know, on top of what I'm seeing, you know, Jamie was talking about customizing his art, his pop art filter is that, um, you know, that's the black and white mode. So that's the grainy, there's grainy, there's grainy film one mm -hmm. and there's grainy film two. That's grainy film one. It's more contrasty. Um, I like to underexpose it by, you know, two thirds of a stop because I want mm -hmm. that really dramatic. like dramatic look. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I have it set to blue tone because I don't want it to be black and white. I've actually, because of Nick software, I fell in love with silver effects mm -hmm. and yeah. there's like, you can, you can kind of copper tone images. And I fell in love with like copper toning for a while. And then I'm like, well, what about the blue? You know, I've, as you can see, my background's blue. I have an affinity <laughs> for the color blue and black, blue and black. Right. Um, so it's, I wanted to kind of get back to cyanotypes, cyanotypes or something, you know, before black and white, that was kind of a thing too. In right. fact, I think one of the first photographs from France is a cyanotype, if I can, is it? I mean, it might be um, from that window. I don't know. I'd have not, to do some not of the, classically trained in photography, sir. <laughs> oh, I, I have some of that background. It was part of our art history stuff. So it's, um, it's just kind of, Maybe it was by Daguerre. I think it was Louis well, Daguerre know, or something. Like I know that. Daguerreotype, but I don't know that they were cyanotype. I know Daguerreotype was like with the first photos, aren't they? Yeah, but I I don't know if they had a blue tint or something like mm, that. But gotcha. re regardless, it's just having instead of it just being, you know, black and white. It's just kind of nice to have a mo monochromatic, you know, with a red tint or a blue mm -hmm. tint, and and you can get that in camera. That's that's the nice thing. Yeah, that's again, that's the beauty of it. And like you said, make sure that you're shooting. Raw plus JPEG, your JPEG, you get yep. what you see. Your raw file is untouched for you to do with what you want. That's yeah, because I, yeah, because I could go back in the Nick software and I could make it. The mm -hmm. I can make it copper, you know, I can copper tone it or just kind of change it to whatever I want it to be. So right, right, for yeah. sure. All right, I'll I'll throw a few photos up here. Just talk about what I've been up to the last since the last time we talked last Sunday, and it's. Timely that you mention uh, Nick's silver effects. So that's kind of what I did. We had our first storm of the season, our first legitimate storm of the season rolled through uh, during the week last week. So naturally, I jumped into my truck with camera equipment in hand and raced off uh, west of where I live over towards Ionia County is where I ended up shooting all my photos. Hey, how's it going, Sandy? Good to have you here. Uh, so this was, uh, I, I'd done a like my own personal podcast, an episode of Between the Minutes where I spoke about uh, shooting in black and white and just how mirrorless cameras in particular make that such a treat to do because you can set your camera into you know your monochrome or black and white mode and what you see in the electronic viewfinder is a black and white image and by doing that for so long, you kind of train yourself on just knowing what is probably gonna lend itself to be a good black and white image. Uh, so that's kind of what was happening here just past history with shooting storms. Anyways, I knew that, you know, to get the definition to come out in the clouds, if I kind of went a little more dramatic with the black and white, I'd be able to achieve that. And that's what I did here. So this was a raw file with the OMD EM one X and the seven to 14 millimeter and uh, just a single frame, nothing bracketed, nothing crazy wild about it. But I knew when I got home, I'd want to throw it into silver effects so that I could start bringing out all the structure and that the leading edge of that storm as it rolled through. Uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was gonna. I don't, I don't know what I was gonna say. It was. It was gonna be something. Are you using the new Nick software, or are you still using the uh, the free resource? I'm still using the one that uh, it was before. Oh. Who bought it? Um, on one or not on one, but uh, Capture One, I think. No, D DXO, D DXO bought it. DXO, yeah. Yep. No, I had it before that. I had it from when it was Google. Um, 
before Google even when it was on their own and then Google bought it. I paid for it once and then Google bought it and made it free for everyone. And I downloaded it again under Google's ownership. And then once it left Google's hands, I just stopped and I'm sitting on the old one that I have. Yeah, me, me too. I, I actually paid 125 like it was like 125 for each compartmentalized thing because there was right. like five different attributes. Yep. And I was like, I can't do that. And then when Google bought it two years after I graduated from college, like 2014, it's like, oh, this is only 125 for all this. So I <laughs> yeah. bought it. And then a year later, it's like, oh, by the way, it's free. And yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 just for for you guys as FYI, for those of you who don't know, the reason Google bought Nick Software is because they own Snapseed. Snapseed. Yeah. And that's what they wanted. Like once they had that, they didn't care about Nick software. So if you guys, if you guys, I mean, they updated it once, which was nice. And then mm -hmm. they kind of retooled some things, but if you guys like editing photos and Nick software makes it really easy, Snapseed is just like a, a, a stripped down version of that, that you can use on your phone. Yeah. It's my go-to for mobile editing. It's pretty much the only one I use. Uh, same here. I don't use anything else. I don't have a need to use anything else. No, agreed. Um, and and the other thing I will say with Nick software with Silver Effects, um, you know Jamie's kind of talking like when you look through the viewfinder and you you see the world in black and white, um, it gets you used to seeing what color will look like or translate in the black and white, and that's what they call the zone system. You know that mm -hmm. that that measure from zero, like white to black, and so you kind of get used to like what those tones will translate to in black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and if you use silver effects and you hover over an area of grayscale in your photo after you make the transition to black and white, you can kind of see where that measure of zero to 10 is at, which is kind of nice. Definitely. Uh, so the next shot, um, I, I had no foreground elements to work with where I was at. I was so intent on finding a location where I had wide open space so I could watch this come in and hopefully get lightning as it was coming in that I realized I got myself into a location where that's all it was, was wide open. There was nothing interesting in the foreground. And I was talking to a friend of mine as I was waiting for the storm to come in and she was asking what the location looked like. And I told her, I said, I don't have anything to put in my shot. She said, well, put your truck in the shot. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. That's a good idea. At least I have that, you know, that I could put in the shot. So the reason I'm sharing this is a couple of things. Number one, this is a live composite shot. So for, again, for those who aren't Olympus users, live composite just allows you to run a really long exposure without potentially overexposing the image. So it was about as light as you see right here in this image when I took that initial frame. And then I just let it run for about five or six minutes, hoping and praying and waiting for some lightning to start to show up. Unfortunately, none really did, but I ended up getting, you know, you can see the movement of the clouds up here in the upper left side of the frame. You can see where there was some movement going on and down. On the horizon, you know, you can see this purple and pink, and that's where there were flashes of lightning off in the distance. But I shared this image just to show what happens, how the camera sees the scene and evaluates the white balance versus actually white balancing off of my truck in post. And that's what I ended up with by white balancing off my truck. Um, kind of like the warmer look to the, to the after image, more so than I do the blue. I feel like it brings out lot more detail in the clouds and just kind of changes the entire feel of the image. So uh, don't forget to play around with your white balance when you're out shooting. That's one of those things that um, I'm always trying to remember to do when I shoot a scene. And I know if I'm shooting in blue hour, which is getting kind of around where I was at with this, you know, considering there were clouds in the sky, it was still a very blue hour look to it. And the blue can just become overwhelming in the scene. And just, I feel like it robs it of some drama or potential. So again, I just white balanced off of my truck. And if you don't have a white thing in front of you to white balance off of, I'm sure you can find something on your person, a piece of paper or something to just set down in the scene. You can Photoshop it out later, clone it out, but white balance off of that. Uh, so the next shot, this shows again what live composite can do as far as being able to capture lightning. Nothing really dramatic. Uh, in this image, but I just wanted to show capturing lightning. So this was about another five minute exposure or so. And this was with the um, the new 12 to 45 that I was talking about earlier. I had that with me to make sure that I could at least put it through its paces and maybe get it wet in a downpour, which I did end up getting it completely soaked in the downpour when I was uh, out shooting. But this is again, like a five minute exposure. Or so probably at, I think F I think F8, it was still fairly light and I needed to stop down a little bit 
to give myself a long enough exposure to be able to enable live composite. So easy to capture lightning. Just let it run until you see lightning. You watch the back of your camera. If you like what you've got, stop the exposure or keep it running. And as more lightning bolts appear, they just kind of stack up and add up in your image. Yeah, they're just, it's like, it's like paint by color, but they just add in as they go. <laughs> yeah, it's such a great feature. I, it's funny, I've got a story to tell about one of the first times I had been out using it for storms. And this was years ago, I think probably 2015, maybe 16. Um, I was out on the pier in Grand Haven as a storm was rolling in and I'm taking photos. I have a live composite image running and this gentleman walks up uh, with a Canon camera on his tripod, you know, and he was, he was trying to shoot lightning and he wasn't having any luck because he was trying to be either quick with his finger or his longer exposures just weren't timing out fast enough to catch the lightning. And he walks by and says, what are you, what are you shooting? I says, well, uh, the storm. He goes, no, no, I mean, what camera is that? I said, oh, sorry. I said, it's an Olympus camera. You know, what are you, you, are you getting lightning? I said, yeah, here, check it out. And he looked at the back of the camera and there's like six lightning bolts on it. He's like, oh my gosh, was that, uh, well, I, 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 I didn't see that many lightning bolts at one time. When did you shoot that? I said, oh, no. I said, this is like 15 minutes worth of, of time. He says, what do you mean, 15 minutes? How come it's not overexposed? And I explained it to him. And he curled his lip. This was ridiculous. He curled his lip and he said, this well, is that's, cheating. That's cheating. <laughs> and he walked away. And he walked away upset at me. And I said, no, 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 no. It's not cheating. It's, it's a tool. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but my hammer is better than your hammer at this type of thing. Don't be mad at me over <laughs> over that. But it was kind of hilarious. I love telling people that story. But uh, who, who is who is that again? <laughs> I'm not sure who it was. Oh, okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to say a name. I'm okay. probably wrong, but I swear I know this person now through online a little bit, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say his name. And if he watches this and if it wasn't him, I apologize for mentioning your name. And if it was you, this is hilarious. We should probably talk about it sometime. Yeah, but I we think should. It, I think it was Blair Solano. This really? was this was years and years and years ago, but for some reason I can recall a little bit what that person's face looks like, and it just kind of reminds me of Blair. And I don't know that it was him, and it probably wasn't him, but um, regardless, it was just a funny situation for sure. Was uh, was he shooting with a Nikon? No, it was a Canon. This was a Canon okay. user. Okay, because because Blair is a Nikon shooter. Okay, good. And so. Blair seems too nice to say something like yeah. that, anyway. So, well, well, I I think he'd be fascinated by it. If anything, he'd be like, "Oh, okay." Like, because I know Blair, I've sold him all, a lot of his stuff, and yeah, he's more of a bird guy, anyways. And actually, he's been published for shooting birds. So nice. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rhonda had something interesting to add because we were talking about Louis Daguerre. Uh, she's so Rhonda, who is an EM one Mark three shooter as of late, mm -hmm. uh, super short art history add in Joseph, uh, Neeps, is it Neepsy or Neeps created first print image printed from a plate via photochemical reaction in 1827. Mm -hmm. Louis de Guerre perfected it in 1839, creating a daguerreotype or a negative Henry Talbot in 1839 slash 40 solved the problem of the reversed image by contact printing on light sense of paper in sunlight and named it a calotype. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So that was something like, again, I got this information back in 2010 and I'm trying to <laughs> retain it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, 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 it's funny because I had thought daguerreotype was the first, but obviously not by like a decade or more. So I think daguerreotype is, was more, was more popular for the time or like that's, um, you know, I just know that there, you know, as far as influence, there was more influence behind Louis Daguerre than, mm -hmm. um, and I think his print actually is out of a window in France, and it's really interesting. We should bring it up next time we do this, Jamie, just sure. to show people. Um, but there's like one guy who's standing, like looking up at the window. It's so weird. It's like because mm -hmm. the exposure has to be so long for those older sure. images. Sure, yeah. And Wild. there's like there's a, and and some people think. Was that Louis Daguerre? Did he go out there and stand and look up at his window as like this kind of weird kind of, you know, self-portrait? It's hmm. like he's looking up at the window for five minutes and then he can go back and run inside and be like, see, that's me right there. Hilarious. So, so that's kind of the thing that that's been kind of conjectured is because there's one person out of people moving on a street, like walking. Right. Yeah. 
There's so, one. So arguably the first selfie is what we're getting at here. Uh, potentially. Yes. Well, yeah. I think some of, I, I think some of all this has been done before. If you think selfies are new, they're not, this has right. all been done way, way before. Yeah. Everything is just a repeat. So good question from hero shots. If Snapseed support CR three net or ARW files, I know that it'll support Olympus's raw files and it supports, um, it's funny. So I just got into shooting Sony and I honestly can't tell you what Sony raw files are called. <laughs> they so, call it ARW. Okay. So it supports my a seven three files. So I hope that answers your question on those, but the other um, raw formats, I'm not sure about those. Um, I'll get or out of these. Just, or, just, or just raw. It's it, no raw is Canon and or maybe, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's not important. It it's it can do it, <laughs> right? It for sure, journey. for sure. Um, let me see. So these just these last couple were just um macros that I had shot out in the woods the other day. You know, I know you and I talked about social distancing and talked about you know proper etiquette for that. You know, as a potential topic for today. Uh, this was me social distancing. I I found a wooded park that has trails near my house. And just ventured out with the EM1X and the 60 millimeter macro. And I took the TG6 also with me to potentially put down in some vernal ponds to do some underwater video, but never ended up doing that. Oh, I've never done that. Uh, it's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun for sure. Um, the, you know, the video is a blast. And then when you start incorporating things like putting it underwater and just watching the the insects swimming around and you know, it's, it's really cool. I got a couple of cool video clips, but nothing that that was compelling enough for me to share yet. Do you, do you like have to wait it or is the camera's weight enough that you can just set it on the, Oh no, the camera's weights definitely enough to, to hold it down for sure. So okay. I just, I start the recording. I have a couple of video clips. I'll tell you what, if we do this again next week, I'll have those video okay. clips and show you. So I just started the recording and then just held the camera like this and then just slowly moved it down into the water. And it's cool to watch the water line rise up yeah. in front of the lens. And then I just let it sit there and then watch these little freshwater shrimp. They look like sea monkeys. Watch them <laughs> swim in front of the lens. And then, you know, just other little critters. I left it under there for about three or four minutes recording. It's kind of neat. That that sounds so cool. I, I, I love the macro feature on that camera. And that's, it's, and that's I have insane. a TG. I have a TG4 and I've got a great picture on my laptop, on my desktop of, uh, of a dragonfly on, on my deck. And just like the eyes, like you can see all the lenses. That's so on, cool. On, on the eyeball. And that's like the coolest thing is that I, that camera, if you just like, who cares if you can, I mean, you can use it for a lot of stuff. You can use it for live comp. Live crying out loud. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but, but the cool thing is, is just like the macro mode alone is like worth every penny that you pay for that camera. Oh, it blows people's minds. I've shown people, you know, snowflake images that I shot that just looked like they were done with a microscope and people are just amazed. I've had so many people yeah. say that's, is that really what a snowflake looks like? Like that? Are you serious? <laughs> what did you do? How did you do that? And then I'd show them this little point and shoot camera. And like, are you kidding me? You didn't have to have this big, crazy, giant, expensive lens and lights. Like, nope. But point Jamie, that's cheating. <laughs> right, oh, it, 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 for sure, it, it's cheating. Oh my gosh, you can cheat on so many levels with that camera. It's not even funny. Why? Do, why does it's like it's like it's like all those times when you like had to put in the cheat code for your game, and really just just buy an Olympus camera. It's cheat mode for photography. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, uh, so John Thomas is asking about the forty to one fifty Pro with the MC twenty and or the MC fourteen. Um, so forty to one fifty with the with the MC14, I've had no issues whatsoever and a ton of experience shooting with that, uh, shooting birds. Never never an issue with focus speed, never an issue with soft images, um, nothing, no problems whatsoever. MC20, now this is the fun one to talk about because if I'm going to hear a complaint about teleconverters, it's always that teleconverter. And this is, this is what I think it is. I don't think that it's the product having an issue. I really don't. And I don't, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, throwing shade at people or whatever, you know, whatever the proper way of saying that is. Um, it's experience with that much longer of a focal length and being able to hold yourself steady to, sh to use it. Uh, because when I first got the MC 20, of course, the first thing I do is I throw it on the 300 and I run out the door and try to find birds. And I come back and I'm like, wow, these are all 
they look like crap. Every one of my pictures look like crap. And I've shot enough birds to know how to shoot birds and get razor sharp images that are gorgeous. And all my images the first time were junk. So then I calmed myself down and I said, okay, I'm gonna start looking at the image and figuring out what went wrong here. Uh, first thing, of course, looking at exit data, not paying attention in the camera so much was um, shutter speed was a little slow. Not super slow, but we're talking, you know, 250th of a second, you know, 400th of a second. On Olympus, that's easy to do, handheld, no problem. The problem is, is that at such a long focal length, even the tiniest of movement is magnified immensely. You know, I mean, you want to see how much that's magnified. Start looking through a long lens at the moon. Bring up your live display and watch the moon track right through your screen in real time. You can watch the moon moving mm -hmm. and you'd be surprised at how fast the moon moves. Now look at it with a wider field of view, your eyes, and you you don't really notice that movement. So well, if it, you think about it with that being, you know, you're you're seeing it that way. I'm using that as an example because now try to put the moon in frame with that lens. Just the tiniest bit of movement takes that moon and shifts it all over the place. So when you're trying to shoot something like birds or animals or what have you, if you're not rock solid and steady, um, forget about any kind of a slower shutter speed whatsoever. You're going to have to have a very fast shutter speed to negate any movement that you potentially are doing. Um, and then also, so that was my, that was the biggest thing for me. It was just movement, movement that I wasn't aware of that I was even doing to such a degree, you know, and even though the 300 has image stabilization that works in conjunction with your body, depending on the body that you've got it on, um, even with those things factored in, I still found that I needed to shoot at a higher shutter speed than I was used to for doing those types of birds. <clears throat> so again, keep it on a tripod. Um, I see people rest their forearm on the lens, you know, I don't know, I can't really get me all in the frame, but rest your forearm over it and just kind of get yourself all stabled up like Justin's doing. He looks like a, a glamour shot pose right there. Oh, yeah, I almost a want to screenshot it. Yeah. <laughs> But it's um, it's all about stability. So I hope that answers your your um, question or your comment there, John. Um, I think what most people run into, though, is just they're not familiar with it enough yet to know the ideal settings to use it in. And, and if I can add to that a little bit, Jamie, um, you know, you're talking about shutter speed and the rule of thumb that I learned from from my instructors was that you kind of took the focal length of your lens and you applied that to your shutter speed. So, you know, when you're using like a 50 millimeter, one sixtieth of a second is is kind of that is you're not going to see your shake with one fiftieth of a second. Mm. And when you put an MC20 on a 300, it's really 1200 millimeters, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to shoot greater than the focal length of your lens. So, you know, uh, one twelve hundredth of a second. Well, you'd have to be at what one two thousandth of a second. Is that a shutter speed? 16, 1600th of a second to Six, 2000. Yeah, 1600 to, to <clears> 120. <throat> yeah, so, I mean, you have to shoot north of what your focal length is. So, right. really, uh, if you're going to handhold, you got to shoot at like 1 4,000th of a second um, with that kind of lens. And it's kind of like the same thing. I know you shoot astrophotography. So, when you have that, that shorter focal length lens, you know, you can run a 20 second exposure. On a, mm -hmm. on a 14 millimeter and not see star movement, you know, but if you put a 70 millimeter or a 200 millimeter on there, you see it right away with five seconds. Right. So. Yep, exactly. And, you know, so Brian Esler said that, uh, so he went to a press event with Olympus down in Costa Rica and he said he got sharp photos with the MC 20 and the 300 millimeter while he was on a boat. Um, I'm going to call BS on that one, buddy. I want to see those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, come on, I, I know you're good, but come on, dude. That's 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 amazing. But it's it's very possible. He's in Costa Rica. If he was on a sunny day, his shutter speeds were at four thousand oh, or six thousandth oh, yeah. or eight thousandth of a second, depending on you know what mode he's shooting in. So it's definitely doable. And and that's another thing I'll add, Jamie, is that a lot of people will shoot it. it uh, we all have to go back to photography means painting or drawing with light. So the quality of light is quintessential. And mm -hmm. if you're going out on a day like West Michigan right now, I don't know what the weather's like for you, but it's pretty much overcast. You know, I'm getting pockets of sunlight, but even on a good overcast day, uh, when you turn everything black and white, because that's how your camera focuses, it uses mm -hmm. phase detection and, and contrast. Well, when there's a lack of contrast, 
right. and there's a lack of vertical and horizontal lines, your camera is going to have a hard time focusing unless you have really, really good sunlight. So if you're in Costa Rica, blue skies, you know, <laughs> sunny, sunny weather. Uh, yeah, that camera is that any camera and lens will sing any day of the week on, on that. Right. And Brian brings up a good point too. So he says boost that ISO. And I, again, I, I don't know the people who have all the issues with this. I've just seen conversations, you know, on and off online about that particular setup, but you know, you might run into the situation too, where in order to get those fast shutter speeds, you're going to have to crank the ISO up to a higher, to a higher level than you might be used to. And if you're not metering properly, then when you use those higher ISOs, you might run into a situation where you tend to lose a little bit of definition as well. Um, not to say that you can't shoot at 1600 or 3200 ISO and have a clean image. It's just, you have to be doing it the right way in order to make that work. So mm -hmm. that's always a, th a thing to take into consideration as well. Or how that 1600 will affect your final image. You know, is it going to be too grainy for what you're going to be using it for? So. Right, exactly. So Mike Hedge mentions, you know, the other thing to be aware of is with the MC20 is that you lose more than a stop of light, you know. So again, you know, you're going to have to be, to get that shutter speed up there, your ISO is going to have to be, you're going to have to be liberal with the ISO unless, again, it's a, a bright sunny day. Um, and I do the same thing that Mike's mentioning, you know. I'll just put on auto ISO and I'll let that, I'll ride it out because I would rather have, an image of whatever it is that I'm shooting than nothing at all because it was a complete mess. You know, if there's a little bit of grain in it, I'm not above, you know, flipping something over to black and white and just kind of treating it a little bit differently. You know, if, if the subject matter applies mm -hmm. or, you know, works well with black and white, but you can always work some grain into black and white and it's fine. Well, and the other thing is if you're shooting raw as well um, and you're within a stop or two of your exposure, you should be able to kind of clean up that ISO if it's high enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't look too bad. You know, like if you were shooting at 800 and you lose two stops, you're going to 3,200. Well, I mean, yeah, you should be able to, as long as your exposure was not too far off, you should be mm -hmm. able to clean it up. Right. Yeah. Software is amazing now for, for oh. working with noise and images. It's pretty astounding. And it just gets better. That's the crazy thing is it just, you know, and the, the crazy, the thing I'm kind of interested in is, you know, with cameras from what I'm seeing in the industry as the processors get better, it's the processors that help clean up the high ISO. Right. Right. And it's, and now they're starting to integrate AI into these cameras. So now they'll be able to kind of say like, Oh, well, these bad pixels tend to do this. So mm -hmm. if we kind of start combining these things um just wait till they start integrating laptops with like an ai chip that was part of the processing right and then you start start getting somebody like photoshop who's like the the, the first person to release ai software that correlates with maybe an ai laptop processing power um invest in that company because they're going right. to help clean up things so so much I would uh, I would do almost anything to have Olympus partner with Google when it comes to that realm. So my phone is the Pixel 4 XL in the night mm -hmm. mode on that little tiny sensor in that phone takes Don't tell insanely me. <laughs> good images. It's oh. insane. And it's all, you know, it's all AI. It's all, you know, machine. It's all it's all done algorithms. It's algorithms. Mm -hmm. It's all it is. And, you know, what computational photography is the hot new term, you know, and that's what it is. So, I mean, if you could put whatever magic Google has in that phone into any camera body, I mean, good grief. Oh, I'm getting and excited thinking about that. <laughs> well, and that's and that's and that's the one thing I like about Olympus. You know, I, I talk to Mike about this when we have conversations on the phone because um, we we like to talk shop a lot, like what's going on in the industry. And I said, you know what? The one thing that. Olympus has that nobody else has right now is computational photography. Nobody yeah, else has live and they, ND. And they have for years. And and that's yeah. the thing is like, if you can just make this better, like, or if you can just keep on adding to this, yeah, nobody will be able to touch you. And that's kind of the thing is like, Sony can't do it or, or hasn't done it. Canon hasn't done it. Nikon hasn't done it. Olympus is the only one who's doing things that are bridging the gap between a removable lens camera and what your cell phones are doing. Right. It just comes down to getting the word out there effectively enough. You know, I mean, so live composites been out forever on cameras. No one's yeah. doing anything. Like that. It's been there forever. And then, you know, Olympus is pro capture mode. Um, I, 
again, I don't know if other camera systems do anything like that necessarily. I know, Pan I know Panasonic did something where they would let you pull still frames from their video, but those were like reduced megapixel still frames. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what Sony camera does pro capture? Uh, it's uh, the a seven R three and up has like this high res. No, it's, no, it's not, I'm not talking about high res. I'm talking about pro capture. So, you know, where you do a half shutter oh, yeah, press yeah, yeah. and starts recording yep. frame. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Panasonic is the only thing that has something closest to that. And, and I they think pull they a still did... frame from video and it's um, a reduced megapixel still frame. Yeah. There's so like in their point and shoots, um, there's a little button on the back and it has like, it has a little 4k thing on it and it gives you three different modes. So if you put it in one of those three modes, you press the button, it's like three different types of pro capture. Mm, um, okay. So there's, so there's like one, which will kind of like when you press the button, it's exactly like Olympus Pro Capture. It'll give you 14 frames prior. Mm. There's one that will kind of give you seconds before and seconds after, and like you can kind of pick in between, like this Very weird cool. thing. It's it's really weird. There's like three different options versus just Olympus's one. So it's yeah, <laughs> it's something to like look worth looking into. I like that, David Black. Isn't computational photography cheating? No. Right. <laughs> it's just no. another tool. <laughs> so it's bro like go ahead, it's go ahead. Uh, okay if my car has eight cylinders are you gonna are you gonna knock me because you got a four banger i mean come on it's like it's what right. i bought into right. uh, it's like don't knock me for what's under the hood of my car yeah. you know knock knock yourself for not being the one who <laughs> didn't right. see the light at the end of the tunnel haters and gonna I, hate it's always and there. I, and i say it respectfully a, a camera is a tool mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want with a camera not all cameras like people are created equally. So, right. <laughs> so Brian uh, said, speaking of AI, what are your guys' thoughts on AI and software like sky replacement, portrait automation, et cetera? Um, uh, go ahead. I'll let you go first. I've got opinions okay. on this. Uh, so, well, so do I. So <laughs> again, again, I like to like, uh, Jamie has a lot of experience in the commercial realm of things. I have more educational um, background, you know, because I went to school for, for all this. And for me, the, there was one, like one of our biggest conversational topics was like uh, photography and ethics, like photo ethics. And one of the biggest things was um, there's a really famous photographer who has an image of a guerrilla fighter from like the war in Croatia. Um, they're on a hill and he's like throwing his back like this and like there's a gun out of his hand and it, it's it, the caption was kind of like he got shot in the back by another combatant mm -hmm. um, never happened the guy like they faked the photo so the thing with that is kind of like the ethics of photography did it happen the way you captured it and for me is you know as cool as sky replacement is and it's a fun tool to have the question that my buddy and I have gotten into deep debate is, does it, is it more photo illustration or is it photography? And photography for me is kind of like you captured it how it was and you can edit as long as the information is there and you're just editing it and tweaking it and you're pulling out that information. You're just trying to extrapolate what and interpret what you saw when you captured that photo. But when you start adding things to a photo that wasn't there, to me, that becomes photo illustration. That becomes a different type of, it's it's photographic art it's no different than being like a graphic designer at that point so you kind of take the perspective of photography is documentation and the other side of that and i'm in the middle kind of um where i see it more as art than documentation so i'm not well, I'm, I'm not opposed to to modifying like if it's funny because i posted that black and white image that i shared at the the beginning of this and someone, the first thing they pointed out was, hey, look, you have telephone poles in your shot because it's well known by people who know me. If you, you go through like my landscape, poles. if you go through my landscape stuff, boy, there are, there's a, a stark absence of telephone poles and cell phone towers in my shots because they just, they don't go with, with my perception of, of that location or, or what I felt when I was there. Um, but with that said, now when we start getting into completely changing everything about the image with a brand new sky that might have been shot in Venezuela while, you know, you're on Staten Island or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, it gets it gets further and further from reality. But at the end of the day, uh, I have no opposition to it for me personally. It's just not something that I would do. 
Um, and then when it comes to the portrait side of things, that's, that's really this weird uh, area that man, not it, it, there are moral issues there involved. Um, I just think it's like, I see these images where they take people and they, they narrow the face like completely and they might mm. shift the eyes to make things perfectly even, um, you know, someone who has, I've got like a pointy tooth or whatever, and they might flatten all of that out. They completely modify a person and those things. Again, I'm kind of really not into that as well. At the end of the day though, it's all art. It's all about your creative vision. And I think as long as you're not, as long as the purpose of your work isn't to deceive people, like the example that you gave in Croatia, the staged image mm -hmm. of someone getting shot, um, that's purely about deception. And they're using photography as a way to get that deception across to people versus where someone who is probably, you know, throwing in a different sky from one location into another scene. I don't know that they're necessarily intent on deceiving people as much as they are creating something captivating and, you know, interesting to look at compelling. So I'm really not too opposed to that in software, Brian, I guess, long way of answering your question. I feel more strongly about it though, when it comes to portraits, um, just because I feel like you're taking away from who the person is that you're shooting by altering. If you start altering them so much, you know, that you're changing the shape of the face and you're changing eye mm -hmm. color and you're doing all those things, a little, little skin smoothing, removing a couple of pimples here, maybe brightening the, the whites of the eyes just a little bit and the teeth a little bit, things like that. I don't take too much issue with that, but drastic plastic surgery via pixels. I kind of don't like that. That pixel surgery. And, and that's, and that's kind of the thing is that, that at the end of the day, it, it is art, right? And art is subjective. And, you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with people editing their photos because I do it myself, right? I mean, that's part of my process. You know, my photo is not complete. That's my digital darkroom. Um, and there are photographers, I forgot which one it is, who he kind of did something like photo composite work. He would take, um, he would, he, I, I got to find this guy because again, art history, right? Or photo history. Mm -hmm. This guy was a film photographer. He would take, he would go out and just capture skies and he would like take 35 millimeter negatives and just cut out skies. And he would like take pictures of people and he'd take pictures of buildings and he just kept file drawers. I remember watching this documentary. This guy had like little um, like library card. What are the, the Dewey decimal system yeah. pulling out little things <laughs> and he's got little negatives, like little sleeves of negatives. And he goes in, he puts them in an enlarger and he would create these beautiful photo composites that were just kind of like, and, and, that kind of like goes back to the ethical argument. There were people in the industry who were just like, what is he doing? He's eroding <laughs> like what we're, he's eroding what we're doing and he's creating things that just don't exist. But when you look at someone like, um, who's the, who's the artist who has like the melting clock? Oh, um, Dali, uh, Salvador Dali. Yeah. Sal yeah. His work was like Salvador Dali and was Salvador Dali wrong for, what is it? Not expressionism. What is, what Surrealism. is that? Surrealism. Surrealism. <laughs> Yeah, so it's almost like the his photo composite work started to kind of bleed into this realm of surrealism mm -hmm. because that's what he was creating. Um, so yeah, like at the end of the day, for me, um, like with the portrait automation, like uh, there's a movie that I'll post on our Facebook page that shows a Dove. It's like a Dove beauty commercial, mm -hmm. and it shows like like this almost plus size woman getting thinned down into a you know crazy model, and it's like they it's a time lapse. It's really it's really awesome. I'll, I'll post it on our page. Um, but when it comes to like replacing skies and stuff, um, and getting a, like, you're starting to add things that aren't there. That's where it starts to, and again, in my mind, it's like more photo composite work. So it mm -hmm. becomes more of photo composite, photo illustration. Um, and that's where it boils down to the art form. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. It's funny. Oh boy. So many heated debates I've seen over the years of, you know, what constitutes photography and what's not, you know, if it doesn't come straight out of the camera, it's not a real photo. And it's like, well, okay. The minute, you know, you pushed the button, nothing became real at that point. So, well, and that's what, that's being a purist and it's okay to be mm -hmm. a purist. You know, it's like some people want to drink unfiltered water. Some people do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, um, so I think we're probably come about to the end of the time here. I think we've been going for close to 90 minutes now. Um, yeah. Uh, it's great. Do you want to do this again next Sunday, Justin? If we're all still in yeah. lockdown? <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 good to do this next Sunday. Um, you know, we can 
bring up John Thomas's question next Sunday. What about double exposures? And I can mm, kind of yeah. pull, pull some up about that. Um, because you know, is that be talking about that? Won't you this week yeah. with Mike? Perfect time yeah, for that. I, yeah. And Wednesday I, it, you know, we can kind of touch on it again. I don't know if you've done any double exposure work, but it's kind of nice to kind of draw a comparison and like who uses it for what. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you guys have any questions in the meantime, um, you know, when, when you see a post, um, you know, hit, hit us up on our Facebook page and say, mm -hmm. Hey, I've got a question for you guys. Um, if, you know, for your next Sunday broadcast at two o'clock, here it is. We'd like to get those in advance because then we can like really, you know, boil it down into the show. So yeah, for sure. Um, cause, cause we're doing this for you guys and, uh, I love the talk shop. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, I'm the one who's just kind of drumming on here. Yak, yak, yak. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's just fun, you know, and I want, I want you guys to be able to go take this and just like be energized and like it fills you up and it's positive and you know. Yeah, you it's know. always fun. <laughs> I'll tell you what too. So um, I'll piggyback on what Justin said about uh, throwing questions at us throughout the week coming up, you know, so that we can kind of have those already answered uh, to the best of our ability and ready for the show. But if you feel or like have sending, samples. yes, if you have, have some samples. images, I would love just shoot them our way and then we can bring them up and we can, if especially, I don't want to do a critique necessarily if not throwing that out there unless you ask for it specifically. But mm -hmm. if you have, you know, an image that kind of goes along with what your question, we'd love to put that up on the screen and yeah, chances, fun. yeah, it's a lot of fun. And especially if it's a, a photo that didn't turn out how you wanted it. And that's part of your question because chances are, if you're running into an issue, somebody else has had that issue or may experience it or is currently having that issue. And if we can answer the question for you with an example of what it looks like, then the people who are watching might get their question answered too. So uh, share those images along with your questions, folks. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, 2 PM next Sunday, you guys, same place, same bat channel or whatever that is. Yeah. The uh, same channel on the camera shop of Muskegon. Uh, mm -hmm. You can, you know, if you guys need anything, I'm I'm there. Look for um, look for our broadcast on WZZM 13 um, on Monday. Um, and I'm still doing Facebook photo challenges. In fact, I would love to incorporate them in such a way that Jamie and I are kind of talking about is, you know, we're asking to see your photos. Um, but I'm able to do a live broadcast and talk about our photo challenge images on air now. So um happy to do that for you guys if you guys love seeing that so sounds good we'll see you guys in seven days 2 p.m thanks jamie appreciate your time man you guys take care out there <laughs>